<laughs> so you, can, you can't imagine how excited I am to be here and to be presenting in, in mainland China. So I've been suspecting um, for a little while that CSCL is about to really explode in China. Ever since I came to Hong Kong a, a year and a half ago and was so impressed by what they were doing there. Um, so, you may not know this, but I happen to edit a little journal here, and uh, just, to, just as evidence for my, my saying that I'm excited about what's going on in China, the first issue this year was dedicated entirely, or almost entirely, to CSCL in Asia, and my, um, my editorial was called CSCL in Asia. Uh, it included Carol Chan's wonderful uh, discussion, in-depth analysis of the network that uh, exists in Hong Kong. Or No, actually, hers came out in the next issue. The, this first issue included um, a similar essay, uh, in-depth analysis of Singapore situation. And when Carol says that I pushed her to talk about micro, macro, and meso, that really came from Chiki Lee's uh, analysis in Singapore. Um, and so that was the first issue this year, and then the second one that just came out, um, my editorial was entitled, Let a Hundred Flowers Bloom, Let a Hundred <laughs> Schools of Thought Contend. Some of you may recognize where that came from. So, um, so that when, when Nancy planned the CSCL conference, including what, what I call the long march through China post-conference. I, I was thrilled to go along and try to encourage other people to come along. And so I was thinking about what can I contribute to what's happening in China. So I can't really talk about knowledge building, teacher practices, policy, that's all been talked about by other people. So I want to talk about educational technology in a different way. And in particular, um, what I want to do is, you might think of it as, uh, suggest that there's a, an opportunity for China to make a great, a great leap forward in educational technology in the sense that I think in my, my little understanding of Mao's theory, he talked about how China could make a leap from a feudal kind of society to a post-capitalist society um, and leap over a lot of the historical development of capitalism, which is a, is a problematic history for many people. And so maybe in a similar way, and I'm not sure how that turned out, but um, at any rate, there's a, maybe a possibility here in terms of educational technology to leap over some of the history of, of problems that have occurred in the way technology has been developed for education. And uh, that's, uh, that's kind of what I want to talk about today, avoiding problems of a technocentric approach to technology uh, for education. And, and emphasizing the educational aspects. So I want to take a, that's why I want to take a historical view, looking at the past, as I see it, of CSCL developments, things that are going on in the, few, in the present internationally among us within CSCL research, and then the lessons with, that we might draw for that, from that for the future uh, work in, in China and internationally. So my... My talk is divided into those three parts, past, present, and future. The past, I want to talk about how within CSCL, um, there's been an expanding, uh, expanding vision uh, at many levels, and I'll go through that quickly. Uh, and for the present, I want to emphasize how people more and more are trying to take alternative approaches and mixed, mixed approaches instead of each person saying, my way is, is the best way, my way is the only way, uh, and so on. And then what are, what are the lessons uh, for the future of research and theory in CSCL? In particular, 
in terms of global collaboration. So how can we start more and more to collaborate globally at the level of research and theory, uh, the way we've seen the practice in classrooms is, is being done. So I'm gonna go through very, very quickly some of the history uh, in terms of the history of educational technology, of how people looked at meaning making in, in CSCL theory, um, and the role of the individual student then. So if, if one emphasizes, as I tend to do, uh, the group level, then people always ask, well, what about the individual student? What's the role of, of that and studying that? What's the role of technology? So if I emphasize uh, designing for educational things, then uh, what, and say, avoid technocentric approaches, yet there is an important role for the technology, clearly. That's what CSCL is all about. Um, so what's that? And then what about things like testing and assessment? So to go very quickly in an outline of the history of education, theory, computer technology, software design, and educational applications. So the, the history of education, a lot of you are, I'm sure, uh, are more well-versed in that than I am. And all I want to emphasize here is that there's been an expansion in history from looking at education and learning as a transfer of facts to the ability of students to construct knowledge and to communicate with each other their understanding. Uh, and that's something that you all understand as part of knowledge building. The history of theory and philosophy. Now this is a Western view, and we could try to add, I guess, Confucius and Mao and whatever. But um, the, the, the only thing I want to say about this is that in the long history of Western philosophy, even though there were many complex theories and reflections um, in the upper half of the chart, people still focused on individual minds and individual ideas. And down through Kant in the 1700s. And I think there was, in my, my reading of the history of philosophy, a watershed event in the few years or one generation from Kant to Hegel. And that Hegel started looking beyond the individual mind to, uh, to groups and whole societies and cultures as being cognitive, uh, cognitive units. And this had a tremendous influence on all of 20th century uh, theory, uh, including C the, the theories that are most important to CSCL. Al although I might criticize some of my colleagues as being theoretically stuck back as, as Kantians, um, I think that the recognized theories that are particularly important in CSCL go beyond that. And I guess, um, you know, certainly Mao's theory follows Hegel, Marx, and so on. I'd be interested in talking to people over lunch or something about what, how Confucius might fit in or other major thinkers. But at any rate, so this expansion, the point is the expansion of the unit of analysis from the individual mind to groups working on knowledge building. And, and that's something that I personally have tried to push an understanding in my own in my own work. So similarly, one could go through the history of technology development and see it as an expansion from isolated machines to networks of machines, and and even bigger than that, social infrastructures, the cloud now, social networks, and so on. Um, the history of software design, I don't know how many of you in here are focused on that, um, but the, the point there is that uh, software design started out very technocentric, so developers were computer scientists who didn't really care about social aspects, they weren't concerned about that, they were concerned about technical possibilities and constraints, 
And that produced huge failures in the development of software, costing billions of dollars to industry and society. Um, and little by little, we've learned to overcome that by starting to think more and more deeply about the human aspect. So ergonomics and human factors was the first attempt to do that. And then human-centered design and HCI in general pushed that further. Then we get to uh, approaches like design-based research and more recently theories like social informatics and socio-technical design, which have expanded this focus on technology to how the technology is enacted by users, how it's adopted by communities, disseminated through society, and used in practice. Uh, educational applications of technology in recent uh, uh, decades has, has gone through a history that uh, Tim Koshman outlined along these lines. Um, here the expansion is support for learning, expanding from a focus on individuals acquiring facts to communities building knowledge. Um, not incidentally, in the, the, la the final step being the development of the precursor of knowledge for by our colleagues. Uh, okay, so moving on to the meaning that's supported and communicated through the top, through the technology. So uh, at the CSCL conference in Hong Kong now, I gave a couple papers on, focused on intersubjective meaning making, where I try to analyze exactly how that takes place in detail in a CSCL environment. Uh, and I and I go back for that to Vygotsky's uh, theory. Uh, and in particular, he has this beautiful discussion in his book about an infant, an infant pointing, and how that pointing, uh, which become, which starts out as a, just an infant sort of waving their hands around and maybe trying to grasp something, becomes more and more defined through the through the infant's interaction with the caregiver, with the mother or father. Um, and becomes a gesture, becomes a meaning-making process, and a meaning-sharing process between the infant and, and the mother. And that's the, that's the beginning of socialization and the beginning of meaning-making as a human activity. So in general, I think this concept of intersubjectivity, which is kind of a big word, all it means is that people understand each other. They get they, they understand what each other is saying. But, ha but, so it's a simple concept, but how does that happen? We don't really understand that very well. That's a very complex process, and our, our kind of simplistic folk theories don't give us a lot of insight into that. So here, here's a, the infant and the mother pointing at a shared object. So. That, that makes them, gives them a shared world. It, play, it situates them in, the, in a world together that's meaningful in the same way, intersubjectively, for, for both of them. <coughs> so I've tried to emphasize this intersubjective uh, group, small group um, unit of analysis. Um, and, and one aspect of that is to say that the individual mind is itself a social product. That's what Vygotsky argued. So the mind of that infant, the fact that that infant learns that to, some meaning about the pointing gesture that comes out of the infant's relationship with his or her um, parents. Um, so a lot of, a lot of people, like our, our common way of thinking about things is we start thinking about individual minds and then putting them together to make groups. But actually, I argue that it works the opposite way. We start as social animals uh, in groups, in fact, in our family, in our local community, and so on, and, be, and individuate ourselves as, as individuals from that. And so understanding pro group processes like inner subjectivity 
is fundamental for understanding the individual mind. And of course, individuals are still involved and contribute to uh, all group processes, just like in knowledge forum, every note is put there by an individual, and you have to understand that pro individual process of posting those notes, but within the context of the larger group. So, a, l a lot of my uh, writing has been to try to um, try to make this distinction between the cognitive work of individuals, small groups, and communities. Now these three, this distinction is a theoretical distinction. In practice, the different levels are complexly integrated and intertwined. Uh, but I think that it's theoretically, uh, in terms of us building our knowledge about these processes, it's important to make, or helpful to make this distinction. And, then, and, and so that if you shift from the individual as the focus to the small group or larger group, then the question of what, what are the implications of that for things like testing and assessment, which have traditionally been based on the individual achievement and measurements of individual students. And uh, I mean, Car Carol and Jan have made some suggestions about that, and I, I personally have nothing uh, to, add, to add to that, but I think it's an important issue. So then coming to the role of technology, so I've argued that, that when people try to design technology purely in terms of technical issues, it's led to great failures. And one kind of failure is that the technology is, is just not adopted and used by anybody, which is sort of the ultimate test. But innovation, innovative software concepts are crucially important for CSCL. Uh, Mar Marlene yesterday talked about how can we incorporate some of these Web 2.0 technologies and the use of cloud technologies and so on in, in, our, in our future CSCL environments. So these technical innovations that are happening very quickly all around us, having maybe nothing to do with education uh, in their origins, are, are ob ob obviously important to us and we need to uh, take advantage of them. But we need to do that not in a technocentric way, uh, but in a way that emphasizes our educational goals and the use of the technology to communicate. Okay, so much for the historical development. Where, where do we stand now in the field of CSCL? And I just want to give some th three reflections uh, based on what I observe going on. Um, so there's a theoretical divide that uh, people often point to. And then there are many different dimensions of analysis uh, and method that one can look at. So the, the theoretical divide is often talked about in terms of quantitative versus qualitative. Some, some researchers do quantitative research, some do qualitative, and never the two shall meet. Um, so I, I don't particularly like the terms quantitative and qualitative. They're, they're, they tend to put down the qualitative workers. Uh, and, and produce a, a hierarchy, which one is better. So I'm trying out the terminology, the objective paradigm and the meaningful paradigm, where the objective paradigm is where people try to uh, use statistics and, so, and coding and so on um, to remove the, the subjective problems of interpretation and produce an analysis that is objective. Whereas the people in the meaningful paradigm look at the meaning-making process and see that as, that as essential. So I think my hope is that this is a less prejudicial way of talking about things that uh, researchers are happy to say, my work is objective or my work is meaningful. But in, in um, 
So one, one idea I, that has occurred to me about whether these are compatible with each other is to look at the, the theory of a, a current uh, German philosopher named Habermas. He talks about how in life in general, in human life, um, there's pr purposive rational action. And that's our primary way of dealing with nature, not with other people, but with nature. So we have our purposes and our goals, and we try to manipulate nature to meet our, to meet our needs and our goals. And, and that has a certain structure, certain logical structure. Um, as, but distinguished from that, he also talks about communicative action, in contrast. And that's where in, interaction with other people comes in, understanding of what other people are saying, negotiation with them, and, and so on. So being a human involves both of those very different kinds of things. And they have different kinds of structures, dealing with nature and dealing with other people. And, and in a way, um, so that they, they're so different that they look incompatible, yet we do both kinds of things. We have to, to, uh, to lead our lives. And so I think there's an analogy to this objective and meaningful analysis. They're both necessary. To understand what's going on in a CSCL setting, we need to do both those kinds of things. Um, even though they look like they're incompatible with each other. And in fact, I think, as you'll see, that I think that uh, people are trying more and more to combine those these days, to blend the strategic goal oriented So students do that. They blend working in the CSCL. They blend strategic goal oriented work on assigned tasks with their interaction with peers. And you can see that when you analyze interaction in a classroom, that there's certain social, inter social interactions going on. The objective analysts might sometimes code that as being off-task because they're looking at the tasks, which are goal-driven. And they look at how people step through the, the process, tasks, doing the tasks, and what that involves, and they code different parts of that. Everything else, which is involves the social relationships that code us off task. Uh, but really, uh, a student's task is to do both things, to solve the problem and to build social relationships. They just, those kind of things look different. But if the student's task is to do both things, then the researcher's task is to analyze both things. And it may take different methods to analyze those different things. Um, okay, so moving on to dimensions of analysis. As I said, I've, I've tried to uh, emphasize that there are differences in analysis and that we need to analyze things. As researchers, we need to analyze what's going on at these different um, units of analysis. Uh, and there's a whole lot of processes involved at each of those levels. So there's quite a bit of work to do. Um, so I've called my own work, uh, I often call it group cognition to emphasize that I'm particularly focusing my own personal work at this middle level. And the reason I do that largely is because, first of all, I think it's a fundamental level, foundational level, in the sense that Vygotsky's theory, as I read him, uh, argues, but also that thousands of researchers in education have focused on the individual level. That's what most educational research has been traditionally. More recently, a lot of people have focused on the level of whole classrooms, like the knowledge form or communities of practice, like in Wave and Wanker's work and many other people. Um, whereas I think very few people have focused explicitly on the small group level as distinctive from the others. So people who usually announce, so I've looked at, there's whole literature about small groups and sociology and so on, but they almost always reduce it 
either to the individual level, that it's a couple individuals working together using individual cognitive processes, or where it goes beyond individual cognitive processes, they say that it's social or cultural or community processes, like participation in a community. Um, but I claim I'm interested to explore whether there aren't some processes that are unique to the small group level, and that, in fact, um, build the foundation of knowledge building that individuals uh, internalize into their own individual knowledge and co cognitive skills, uh, and also that gets externalized often as artifacts um, as, as part of a culture or community and, and become preserved in that way. So um, back in when I was just getting started doing this research, I tried to, I felt there was no theory about it uh, and no representations of it. And so I tried to uh, come up with something just sort of off the top of my head. And I had this idea, this, this weird idea, that what a researcher should do is develop ideas and throw them out there into the community for other researchers to pick up and build on and rise above and refine. I forget where I got that crazy idea exactly, but you can make guesses. Um, so I came up with this, and I thought, you know, is this is this valid? I don't I don't know. It's just a an attempt that I put together one night. It turns out, quite to my astonishment, that this is my most cited work. <laughs> the, it, it probably took the least amount of uh, you know research going into it. I just sat down one night tried to think about how to sketch this stuff out, how one might. Um, and then, lo and behold, I come to China to yesterday for the first time ever in mainland China, and people start coming up with me saying, I looked at this chart, and I've, I've added this box and that box and so on. <laughs> it's quite amazing. It really shows how knowledge building in the CSCL community does work, and this has been developed. I've also tried to develop and refine the idea. So in 2006, when I uh, published my book on group cognition, uh, I published that article, I republished that article, and as kind of an appendix, I said, well, we don't really need to visualize it quite that way. You, you know, we're not stuck with that representation. There are some very different ways of visualizing some of the same relationships. And so I gave an example like this, that uh, a friend of mine in Germany had this method of representing things like this, and he helped me work this out. So this was a, a collaborative refinement. And more recently, I've been trying to develop it further. And so this is my latest attempt. But you don't have to take pictures. My slides will be available. Um, so here we have, again, the individual, small group, and community units of analysis. Um, and this is sort of uh, picturing what are the constraints, not, not processes, but more constraints, on where the knowledge building takes place. So knowledge building takes place in individual reflection. It takes place in sequential small group interaction. It takes place in community decision making. And these, so these are interrelated. I guess I should have arrows between, I think I've, actually I've refined this again, but <laughs> after I made this slide, uh, so there should be arrows between these, and then, um, and then they have these constraints on them from, from the different levels, and they feed into um, things like artifacts, now theory, theory artifacts, knowledge building artifacts, uh, which become the group outcomes, and then may become preserved as part of the community culture. So I think this is, this is kind of a nice uh, example of knowledge building, idea refi theory refinement at work. 
So, in, more generally, I think there are, are lots of dimensions of analysis. So, if somebody, if some researcher um, uh, develops the attitude, you know, my way is the only is the best way to analyze CSCL interactions. My way is the you know is the key to understanding my my little my narrow one one way approach, then I think uh, they're missing the point of how complex the, this, this whole thing is. See, it's, uh, learning, collaborative learning, collaborative knowledge building is, is complex beyond all of our imagination. Um, and just to indicate some of the things, there are these whole different temporal dimensions, like Marlene just mentioned that Kai Hakarainen wants to do a 10-year study. So there the temporal unit is 10, 10 years. I like to look at uh, interactions that are about one minute long. You could even look at things going on within one individual posting, which is, I guess, a couple seconds, or how people pause in face-to-face, -face, which might be you know, a few seconds. Um, and then, of course, all different levels in between there. Um, I think we're just beginning to, un to uh, develop methods for analyzing temporal sequences and, and temporal movements. Uh, a lot of analysis has been focused on, you know, what, what does the student know now and what does he know now? Uh, and not, not so much looking at the whole temporal sequential process of interaction that took place to get the student from, one, from point A to point B. Um, then there are a huge number of different learning issues. And I mean, if you look at the literature on individual learning, there's people writing about all different kinds of things. Um, and I'm sure that there are as many issues at the other levels. Um, and so what do you do with this if you have all these different approaches possible, all these different foci possible for your research? Well, more and more people are looking at what sometimes at the conference was called multivocal methods. So it comes from Bakhtin's theory of different voices. So if you have a number of, if you have, you know, three researchers in the room, you may have them speaking in four or five different voices, at least three, but probably more, um, because they've internalized, you know, the voices of their teachers and the other people that they talk to and that they've read and so on. Um, and so for research, what's it mean for research? Well, if you have some, some interesting data, if you have this interaction that you've captured a trace of, where a group of students are building some knowledge together and you think that's really interesting but you're not sure how to analyze it. Maybe you need to bring together a few researchers and have each of them um, analyze them, analyze it in a different way and then think about how those all fit together to give a richer picture and influence each other. Um, so one thing I'm concerned about in, in schools of educational technology and of educational research is that students, graduate students, are, are often trained in specific techniques. Okay, so they're given training in uh, certain kinds of experimental design, certain kinds of statistical analysis, uh, and maybe certain kinds of interaction analysis and so on. Um, and then they go out, it's like you give, you've given them a hammer, and so the whole world looks like just a bunch of nails. You can use your hammer to hit every one of those nails, the same hammer. Well, uh, it's not the way I think it needs to work in CSCL research. What you need to do is say, what am I interested in this data? What does this data suggest how it could be analyzed? 
in a meaningful way, and then let me go and figure out a method that can do that. Uh, and I think more and more uh, researchers are recognizing that the methodological approach needs to be based on the data, one's research interests, and so on, and, and not the other way around. The other way around is kind of a technocentric thing again. I have this technology, so let me apply it there. And so uh, I know that a lot of you, for instance, like uh, social network analysis or LSA, and I'm always skeptical. Is that the right tool? Is that really showing us what we need to know about this particular kind of data? Sometimes it is. Sometimes it gives us great you know, visualizations and great connections and so on, and it really gives a rich access to, to the data. Sometimes it doesn't. And uh, you know, I have a colleague, I won't mention his name, back at my home school, and he's, uh, you know, he comes in being all excited about social network analysis. He went, that's what he wants to do, and he spends a lot of time. And every time he stands up and talks about it, he only talks about the technology of social network analysis. Centrality this, and peripherality that, and these complex diagrams that you can't really see what's going on, except there's a lot of lines crossing the nodes. And I, and I always ask him, you know, what's the educational content here that you're exploring? What are you learning from this? And, and luckily, he's, he's moving along to start to answer those questions. Um, so I think a lot of lab, so often uh, it is important that, that individual researchers get skilled at particular approaches and that they focus, it takes a lot of time to do a good analysis using any of, any of the methods. And that's about all that an individual researcher can usually do, is uh, one kind of analysis. But, but what's needed then is to, for that researcher to, to see herself or himself as part of a, a lab that has multiple approaches. And that's how, so if I just, if I say for CSCL research we need to use these six or ten very different approaches, then some graduate student is going to say, oh my god, how am I going to learn all of those? It's hard enough for me to learn the one that my curriculum is teaching me. So the thing to do is then to go to a, a lab, maybe as a postdoc or a visitor or a collaborator or whatever, maybe in another part of the world where they have a different approach, uh, and work with them as many of you do. I think that's one of the great things about, as I understand it, about researchers in China, that they're really encouraged to go visit other labs. I think uh, Americans are too uh, parochial and, and don't, don't do nearly enough of that. It's also a matter of the, uh, the rewards that one has in different settings. Uh, in particular, so as the editor of this journal, uh, I've seen more and more of these mi mixed method uh, papers. And sometimes, so there's an example, for instance, uh, where a really um, high, highly, um, high, highly ranked uh, researcher sent, or group of researchers sent in um, a paper that was it was brilliantly written, and they did a very rigorous, obviously a very rigorous, quantitative study of their data. And unfortunately, they came up with basically no results. And, I, and I, I looked at this and I said, you know, why are they submitting this with no results? And what's the point? What are other people supposed to learn from this? And as I read the paper, it, it dawned on me gradually that um, they probably had something really important in their data. They were just missing it because of their method. They applied um, 
Well, it may have been not necessary for them to apply the method that they did in order to get to that point. But now they had to go beyond that and look at the processes involved. And I, I often have this feeling with quantitative uh, um, papers that say, um, we observed this, this correlation. If you do this, then the results, the student learning results, uh, improve. Um, and, and then they have this section called discussion towards the end of their paper. So they've done this whole rigorous, you know, analysis with statistical measures that I never even heard of before, and these big tables and so on, uh, with all the Greek letters, and then, um, and then, and then they have this discussion thing, which is not even anecdotal. I mean, it's pure speculation. Oh, maybe it could be because of this. Or on the other hand, maybe it could be because of that, and, you know, we don't know, but uh, in future research, we're going to figure it out. And then they never get to that future research because they published this article. Um, and so I said, I'm rejecting this article because I don't think you've captured the data that you would need to explain the interesting thing that's going on behind the scenes that you've lost because you were so focused on doing the quantitative analysis. And then the lead author came back to me at, um, when we met at the last CSCL conference, in fact, uh, and she was, actually, she, she got the email from me while we were both at the conference. It was quite embarrassing. She was almost in tears. Um, I guess she needed to get this published to get her next job or something. And, I had been maybe less than kind in how I worded my review. Um, but she said, we do, we do have the data to do it. And I said, great, go back and do it. Don't leave it for future research. Send me the article back with that section. And unbelievably, she did that. And it's now been published in the journal. And it's a great article. And she, then they were really able to by combining the quantitative with the qualitative analysis, they were able to show what was going on that was missed in the quantitative result of no, of no uh, significant finding, and to show why that interesting thing really happened in terms of the processes of the interactions among the students. And more and more I see that. I see people using both approaches in the same paper and coming up with things that are just so much more meaningful and interesting. Okay. So, what can we learn from the history of CSCL and from these observations about its current state? And I'm not sure how, how much more time do I have? Okay, so let me go through these six lessons. That should take too long. Um, it may take decades to implement it, but I can, uh, I can summarize what I think you should be doing in a couple minutes. So, lesson number one, learn collaboratively in multidisciplinary labs. I, I already mentioned that, and you know, one, one example is when I visited the lab in Hong Kong, and I saw people working who come from all around the world, who go all around the world, visitor, visiting other labs. Um, uh, and Singapore is another great example where they've, they've worked really hard to bring together people, researchers from around the world, to work in that multidisciplinary lab. Unfortunately, I'm stuck in the United States where they don't support that kind of thing very much. So, in terms of technology uh, development, a lot, a lot of programmers and students of programming have this notion that, um, that Bill Gates was this kid working in his garage and he created Microsoft and became 
the richest person in the world, and that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to drop out of computer science after two years, and I'm going to found the next big thing, because I have an idea that popped into my head while I was sleeping the other night, and I'm technologically uh, a geek, and I can program it, and that's end of story. Uh, all I need is a garage, which I'm going to borrow from my father. Um, but that's, that's a myth. Um, you know, Bill Gates, uh, he worked with industry a lot. He was actually, it's not such a pretty story about how he created his monopoly. So, um, and anyway, you know, his, his technology is not what we need in the classroom. It's not designed for the classroom. Uh, it's, it's a lot easier to design a generic software than it is to design software that's going to support some complex process like knowledge building in classrooms. So, um, so while we need these people who come out of computer science programming courses, we definitely need them uh, to work with us in these, in these labs um, where there's other people there who understand the educational implications and so on. We need their creativity and so on, but we need to guide it and scaffold it, one might say so that it produces something that's really useful and productive. So that was lesson one. Lesson two, um, you, need to, you need to study theory and different approaches. And when I teach a CSCL course, these, these are my, the readings that I start out with. I, you know, I think Vygotsky's foundational. That book is just so rich, the little book. Um, same with Le Leif and Wanger's Situated Learning. And then Tim Koshman put out, um, back in 96, a compilation of, of, of great papers that were the beginning, laid the foundations for CSCL, including Carl and Marlene's paper that they think is a little, that they've gone beyond it. But it's there, giving some of the original ideas. Uh, Jerry, Jeremy Rochelle's paper, where he uses a simulation of uh, physics and analyzes it in a quite complex way. Um, and, and then uh, Tim's introduction, where he talks about the history that I outlined on one of the slides. So uh, that's just a, a suggestion of a where to get started if you're just starting to study the field. And of course, that's not the end. Uh, so lesson three is this notion of design-based research. So more and more um, educational research, and especially CSL research, uses this approach called design-based research. And <clears throat> if you heard Carl's talk at the conference about um, Belief, uh, belief mode and design mode. Design-based research takes the design, design mode approach and says, yes, we're going to do experiments. Yes, we're going to analyze the results. But we're going to do that in order to develop our technology further to get the design implications. We're going to do that in order to develop our theory further. We're going to do that in order to develop, to develop our methodology of analysis further. These things are not things that we take as fixed. We don't start from, I do this kind of method, I adopt this theory, and so on. Um, and this is the way the classroom is, and now I'm going to do some analysis. But, um, but we try to iteratively move through examples and develop all of this. We find, we find all of these ideas um, 